Good morning, everyone. It's really a great pleasure being here. DAC 60 years, it's amazing. We heard yesterday in a great um, keynote and also in the visionary presentation before how important semiconductors are, how strategic they are, how important the work is which we are doing, how important AI is, may become. We did not talk about one kid on the block, which I would like to talk about, and this is quantum computing. For the first time in history on the computation, it's that computing is branching because we are using quantum computers, which is a completely new paradigm of computing. And today, it's a very dynamic, exciting time because the first quantum computers exist, but it's also in a very early phase. But we are now at the stage where we can develop a quantum computing roadmap. And this quantum computing roadmap it will lead us towards quantum advantage. And that's what I would like to talk today about. Quantum advantage, we are not yet there. What is it? It's the time when quantum computers can compute a task which classical computers cannot not do, or can only do at a, can, or quantum computers can demonstrate this quantum advantage where they calculate things faster, more precise, or things which can't be done cal uh, by classical computers or at less energy, but important for a problem which is relevant to business. So before I dive deeper, I want to congratulate you about the 60 years of DAC, because I find it very, very impressive that already at the stage of 64, this has started, and it's amazing. But something else became 75 years in December, and this is a transistor. That transistor, also has developed over many years in an unimaginable way. 75 years ago, we wouldn't have believed what is possible today. When in 1947, this transistor showed up, then a lot of engineering efforts, a lot of new breakthroughs have gone into developing the roadmap of semiconductors. And here you see the FinFETs, but then of course here IBM is also very active in this area of semiconductors, working on the nano sheet, which is currently introduced. And there is more to come because the next step may be to go to vertical nanowires transistors. And just to share with you, my first work after working on organic LEDs was to demonstrate the first vertical silicon nanowire transistor in 2005. A lot of things have, have happened, and today, of course, this is done on 300 millimeter and in high precision. So lots of things have been enabled by the semiconductor industry, and we have high performance computing, but on the other edge, we also have mobile devices. But there is still one thing, there are still intractable problems which classical computers cannot solve. And so these problems are very important. We use approximations. We learn how to use these approximations, and sometimes they work, but not always. And so these are four quick examples to show you that there are important problems which are relevant for our society and for our future, which being solved could help a lot. One is to improve nitrogen fixation by creating ammonia-based fertilizer. The Haber-Bosch process takes about two to three percent of the entire energy consumption in the world. If we could do this at room temperature and with low pressure, we could save a lot of energy. Or finding new catalysts for CO2 conversion. Or also in the, in the better financial models, and of course also in the medical area, there are many unsolved problems, like for example, new classes of antibiotics to be developed because of the emergence of multi-drug resistance. So this is a new kit on the block. And this picture has become, for me, synonymous of quantum computing. But if you look at it, I'm sure all of you have seen it, it's actually mostly the fridge. So the processor is only the small square thing at the bottom on the copper plug. And this is a quantum processor. And you see it looks very different because it's about quantum information. 
it's cooled down to 15 millikelvin. So what you see are the different cooling stages. You see the microwave lines going down because we talk to this quantum processor, which is based on superconducting qubits with microwaves in the range of five gigahertz. And it needs to be shielded because it's very sensitive. That's why it's cooled down to 15 millikelvin, which is very cold, but we have this technology already well under control. You know this very well. The bits, classic logic, you use it on a daily basis. And I want to show the analogon of the bits, which are zero and one, and the classic, classic logic circuit, which is a, a set of gate operations. And it's a unit of computation, and we use this analogy to talk about quantum, because now we have quantum bits. They are more complex, you see already in the picture, because a quantum bit is a superposition of two states, of the state zero and the state one, and A and B, these numbers are complex numbers, which actually describe the probability of, uh, in which the probability of where you find the state uh, one or zero after your measurement. And then you also have quantum circuits, and these are a set of quantum gate operations on qubits, and we call this a unit of computation for quantum computing. So very different is that the scaling behavior of the performance of quantum computing, because now with these uh, qubits, actually they provide two to the power of n basis states for computation in the ideal way. So when we look at simulating the qubit behavior and how qubits interact, by a classical machine, then you see here what is needed from a memory point of view. And it actually increases very fast. With two qubits, 512 bits, but if you go to 35 qubits, you already need 550 gigabytes. And if you go beyond 100, then you come to numbers which are no longer possible to be simulated by a classical machine, not today and not in the future. So what do we want to do with quantum computers? and uh, this is shown here, it's not to replace classical computers, but it's to use them for things where classical computers may have a limit and where we can demonstrate this quantum advantage. So there are easy problems for classical computers. These we are not targeting. There are hard problems for classical computers, and one example, of course, is factorization, because that's not possible classically, because you have an a increase of the complexity, which is exponentially in your computation. And so with quantum computers, there are certain sets of problems, mathematical problems we're looking at. And one is simulating nature, that the core, like using the physics of quantum computing for solving problems where quantum physics is the base. This is in physics and chemistry and material science. Then mathematics and data with structure, like machine learning problems, ranking in the symmetric groups, or also factoring, which I mentioned before. But there are also other problems, like non-exponential speed-up can be achieved for sampling problems, for optimization problems, risk analysis, and option pricing. And you find actually examples of these mathematical problems in all the different industries. And for each of them, you get different uh, uh, speed-up. So for simulating nature, you can actually achieve a greater than polynomial speed up. For the mathematics and data structure, you can achieve an exponential speed up. And for, like for example, for quantum Andre Carlo, it has been shown that a uh, quadratic speed up can be achieved by using a quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. So our mission is to build up quantum computing systems and makes them useful for calculations and for the world. So we started many years back in exploring and researching quantum computing, and in 2016, we had the first time a five qubit processor, and it actually was built in that lab or, or uh, measured and used in this lab. So you see here actually the fridge, which is now behind uh, that uh, white cylinder. You see a lot of electronic instrumentation, like a typical lab. And this was all done, you know, by physicists, actually, the measurement, etc. So it's a typical physics lab. But since then, we have built up that system that we can bring it into a data center, that we can have it run by engineers and not really as a specialized quantum physicist. So over seven years now, we have these machines on the cloud. 
And meanwhile, there are currently there are more than 20 systems available through the cloud. Already more than 450,000 users are working on quantum computers and doing research and developing with them. There are lots of partners we work with on quantum computing and looking into the algorithm, into the applications, and developing the applications for the different industries. And uh, also from the research side, by making this computation accessible in 2016, we have actually, I think, really uh, increased the dynamics in the field because suddenly people had access to quantum computers and can really utilize them and do research with them and develop them and test them and further, ex further advance and accelerate the development. So more than 2,100 publications are already done. So we build a full stack and uh, starting from the qubits, quantum processor, components, wiring, the compiler, the error mitigation, error correction, software, the compute architecture, because you always have an interaction between the classical and the quantum computer, middleware, de delivering this through the cloud, and of course, further developing theory and algorithms and applications. So let me now quickly go through the quantum computing hardware, because there are actually many different types of qubits which can be, where the quantum computation can be implemented into physical hardware. And so you can use trapped ions, which can provide you a two-level energy system or neutral atoms, but also photons, spins, or quantum dots, but also other solid-state qubits are currently investigated for demonstrating uh, quantum bits and also solid-state defects. We are actually using superconducting circuits for our machines. And let me briefly guide you what are superconducting Qubits. So here is a former processor which we built a couple of years back, but you see very nice, nicely these squares, which are the qubit, and these lines, uh, these curly lines going to the qubit. And so what you see here is then the superconducting qubit, which is a Josephson junction. It's a, uh, um, a metal insulator, metal sandwich with a 100 times 100 nanometer uh, square um, region. And it's shunted by a capacitor. And then you have the microwave uh, quantum bus resonators or microwave readout resonators. And these are the different components. So you have two things, the superconducting qubit. And important here is that the Josephson junction actually provides you a nonlinear inductor. And therefore, you get an unharmonic energy spectrum, which allows you to control your information in the state 0 and 1. And the, t the coherence times are in the range of 100 microseconds up to milliseconds. I will talk about that later. And important is the gate time. How long does it take for the gate operation to happen? And for single qubit gates, it's about 10 to, 20, 10 to 50 nanoseconds. And for the two qubit gates, which takes a bit longer, it's about uh, 500 nanoseconds. And these are, we control these qubits by microwave, uh, by microwave pulses. And with these microwave pulses, we can so uh, shape uh, or control the qubit state. And then we have the microwave resonators because we need to also talk to the qubits to um, initialize the state, control the gate operations, and also read out the state. So now this is simple demonstration of how it works. You input your classical pr your program in a classical manner on a classical computer, then this quantum circuit is generated with these different gates this is um, transformed into microwave pulses. These microwave pulses then go to the quantum processor in the fridge. Then the quantum computation is done. You read it out and you get your result, your measurement on your classical computer. Meanwhile, it's more complex because uh, there are many different capabilities and features which are allowed on our machines. So if you drive a new technology, it's very important that you have the right benchmarks. And this is a research part in itself. So it's very important to drive performance. And so we have three key metrics to measure performance. One is the scale, the number of qubits. But that's not sufficient. We also need the quality of the qubits. And one part is the circuit fidelity. But this includes actually more parameters. And then the speed, which is the circuit execution speed, because you want to get your result in a decent amount of time. So let me talk about scale. And scale is how we advance the number of qubits over time. 
And what you see here is in 2019, we were able to demonstrate a 27 qubit chip, then one year later, 65 qubits, another year later, 127 qubits, and last year in November, we have for the first time shown a 433 qubit processor, which is, and you see, they're all named after birds. So the one from last year is called Osprey. And for each of those generations of processors, we had to, of course, do breakthrough things in order to make them work and enable them to be built. So for the Falcon processor, it was actually very important to increase the qubit yield and figure out how we can do a post-processing um, process in order to uh, shape the, the frequency or uh, shape the distribution of frequencies on our qubits. We also introduced bump bonds. Then for the Hummingbird, we introduced multiplexing for readout. Uh, for Eagle, was the first chip to actually go beyond 100 qubits, and this made it important to demonstrate multi-level wiring, because if you have 100 qubits in, an, in a plane, you can no longer um, you know, contact them in the plane, so you have to go 3D. And so we demonstrated here multi-level wiring in through substrate vias. And for the Osprey, we demonstrated for the first time Flex IO. So I will show that in a bit more detail later. So what you see here is now the packaging, which we have developed. We have uh, the qubit um, plane, which you see here, and then another plane, which actually includes the resonators, which are important, and here you see the through silicon, uh, the through substrate uh, vias. So, and you see also that the size of the chips have increased, right? So let's continue. This is a layout of the chip. You have all these white points are the individual qubits, and uh, they are, uh, this is a connectivity map. So we have um, alternating two and three um, interacting qubits with each other. And uh, as I mentioned before, important to be able to demonstrate this type of high number of qubits is that you go in a, in a complete package. And this package, of course, we know from the semiconductor industry how to package. But this has different challenges because now it has to work at 15 millikelvin and it has to have super conducting uh, lines. So 433 qubits, and we all love this picture, but imagine 433 lines going down in your fridge. So you see it's getting very, very dense. And unfortunately, these wirings had to disappear and we had to introduce flex cables in order to enable the further scaling of higher number of qubits and have the lines going down and have it reliable and of course also make it fast and save time. Another important part for further scaling and challenge is the electronics. When you look at the five qubits which we had in 2016, you see it was based in the lab. We had off-the-shelf electronics, which is also very expensive. Then we developed the first generation of, of electronics uh, where we could then for, uh, drive 20 qubits by one electronics rack, and the 40 qubits then in generation two by not even a full rack. And then for the 400 qubits, we had to actually develop a generation three electronics which also allows actually faster, um, we optimize it of course also for new capabilities which we need to do with the qubits and also for fast, like fast speed of the gate operation and readout, et cetera. And so for these 400 qubits, we, don't, we now do not even need a full rack. The next step we do here, and you may see this little dot above the thing, this is the Cryo CMOS controller we are currently uh, developing. And actually, we have uh, um, demonstrated a full-featured 4-Kelvin cryo CMOS qubit controller, which includes the sequencing, the control, and the mixing. So it doesn't sit at 15 millikelvin, but at 4 Kelvin at a higher cooling stage. And we were able to demonstrate also that we achieve a very good 2-qubit uh, gate fidelity with this. So now let me move on to quality. One is to be able to demonstrate these high number of qubits, but we also have to improve the quality of the qubits in order to move toward error mitigation and error correction. So when you look at the, how the coherence time has evolved over time, then in 1999 we had nanoseconds. And uh, on this logarithmic scale you see that there was quite an improvement more than 100,000 times over the last two decades. 
And it has come with a lot of different um, um, innovations, whether it's a type of qubit which is used, materials processing optimization, and uh, UHV packaging, shielding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is more actually needed. And what we observe is by making now many, many qubits, we also learn a lot and can iterate very fast, have fast learning cycles. And this I would like to share with you here. We have different generations of chip, and we also, with each, each generation, we have different iterations where we include optimization in another revision. So in Falcon, uh, you see here the coherence time of the revision five, and for Eagle, the first time we build it, and you see that they already match up. So the learning has gone into the next generation, and uh, we have improved uh, here also the coherence time to reach uh, a median of about 300 microseconds for a Falcon and Eagle. And actually on test devices, we already have uh, a couple of milliseconds coherence time, which we are now going to implement, of course, also in the processors which we build. So that's very important. And, um, and uh, the other part, the other high important parameter is actually the gate fidelity. Uh, and here what you see is a uh, 2-qubit gate fidelity, and um, the, good, um, the, the area where you want to be is on the right-hand lower side. So you want to reduce your um, error rate, and we are reaching now on the accurate chip, it's revision 1, 99.9 uh, .9 fidelity. So the other part is speed, and speed depends on a lot of different things. We actually had defined uh, the so-called circuit layer operations per second, and this is a holistic benchmark where we can also compare different uh, chips and different implementations, and it's a holistic benchmark for the performance of the system. The key ingredients are the circuit execution, the circuit delay, the compilation, the runtime compilation, and also data transfer. So the interaction between quantum computing and classical computing and electronics is very key. The superconducting qubits are very nice because they allow you actually a fast uh, circuit to be built because they have a fast gate operation. Also high fidelity fast readout has been achieved by new electronics advanced electronics uh, for fast circuit run, and also working on the compiler and the, um, and the software uh, led to uh, quite a few improvements over the years, and a big jump actually last year, where we are currently reaching 15,700 clubs uh, by implementing parametric compilation, which actually created a big step forward. So now let's move to the roadmap. The roadmap, this I mentioned already, the, the lower part is actually the hardware, and then on top we also have to build the software that people can use quantum computers in an easy fashion without being a quantum expert. And so we have different abstraction levels, the kernel developer, the algorithm developer, the model developers. And of course we are up for this year for a new challenge, because end of this year we want to demonstrate a, a quantum processor with more than 1,000 qubits in one full reticle. And we also open another path of scaling, which is actually modularity. And this is a very important path because it allows then faster scaling up and also the size of the chip uh, stays in a, re in a decent uh, uh, size range. So with Heron, we actually want to demonstrate a classical communication between uh, the quantum processors. And uh, this requires a universal bus and a controller. And this allows us actually different features because now these we, have, we can parallelize uh, different jobs. And then the year after, in 2024, we want to demonstrate Grossbill, which is actually also a modular chip, but now we are working actually on using quantum gates between these individual chips, which means now they appear to the outside world as a big quantum processor. And this modularity gives us now a tool set of further scaling up the number of qubits to 10,000 and uh, 100,000 of qubits. And uh, by 2025, we want to demonstrate Kookaburra with more than 4,000 qubits. And then beyond, of course, we haven't defined it yet specifically, but we want to go beyond and increase the scale and quality and come also from a software level, increase the uh, features which uh, you can use at quantum computers like error mitigation, error correction, 
threaded primitives, dynamic circuits, and other features, and also uh, uh, make quantum computing available as a service uh, software. So you may have seen recently, a couple of weeks ago, we announced that in 2033, we want to build a system with more than 100,000 qubits. And of course, that's uh, quite a ambitious roadmap, which we are um, pursuing. But we know from semiconductors that roadmaps are important. So I want to use the remaining time to go a bit into the features and talk about error uh, suppression and mitigation, but also about um, you, how we approach these big mathematical problems to be solved by the lower number of qubits which we currently have available. And so one, one um, approach, um, and I find this very exciting that the algorithm researchers come up with really exciting uh, new ideas of how to actually cut your bigger problem into smaller problems and have these smaller problems then run on the parallelized quantum hardware. And so there are different techniques. I don't want to go into too much detail, but there is embedding, entanglement forging, or circuit cutting, and we all uh, have them under the term of circuit knitting, where we use the quantum resources and the classical resources and combine their advantages with each other. So in the area of embedding, you actually have a bigger molecular problem, for example, and you have one specific area where you have high entanglement. In this specific area where you have high entanglement, you cut out and you do by the quantum processor, the rest you calculate then classically and you combine this together afterwards. And then circuit cutting is a similar path. You have a big quantum circuit and you realize that there are certain areas where you don't have a lot of entanglement between these regions and then you cut them apart and you, have, and you can run these smaller um, problems then on, on the parallel um, quantum processors and stitch it together afterwards. So errors, I didn't talk about, but errors are important, as we all know from the classical world. And so often in quantum, in quantum, errors can appear quite a few because we have uh, very sensitive quantum information which we want to deal with, which we have to deal with. So we must deal with errors because they can happen already at the initialization stage, on the gate operation, but also during measurement. And uh, we know the classical error correction, an easy pass is to employ redundancy, right? So you have a repetition code, and this, however, doesn't work for quantum because quantum information cannot be copied because of the no cloning theory. So a qubit cannot be copied. So we have to utilize a different approach, and we're actually utilizing parity checks for error correction, but this comes with a large overhead, as you see in the picture. So this is a surface code, which is correcting face flips and, and, um, and um, bit flips. And um, you have invite the data qubits, uh, the bit parity check in blue, and the face parity check. So you need about 50, 25 data qubits for one logical qubit. And so there's currently a lot of research going on in error correction. Um, and uh, we will see where this goes. But there is another field actually before error correction, and this is error mitigation. And I think I wanted to share this more details here because I think it's a very exciting area. And the idea behind this, you have here a, 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 um, a sketch where you have the simulation cost of the y-axis and the quantum circuit complexity as an x-axis. And so this is a problem which is shown here where the classical computing resources would exponentially increase. With the quantum error correction, as I mentioned before, you have this overhead, which makes it for easy problems difficult because you have this large overhead uh, which you need to take care. And um, so far, we cannot implement it with the, with the number of qubits we currently have. And then we have quantum error mitigation, which is actually something in between. We learn the error, we understand the error, and we hope to mitigate it. And this can allow then a sweet spot in the area where you have less resources you need than the quantum error correction, and also less resources you need for the computation than for classical compute. And this is a path where we currently approach, and this allows then also a continuous path towards error, error correction by using error mitigation. So error mitigation uses outputs from ensembles of circuits to increase the accuracy of the expectation values by doing some post-processing afterwards. And there are two simple examples. So there is one probabilistic error cancellation where you have your unitary operation you want to do. 
you have uh, an error which is connected to it, and in principle you can just say, okay, I inverse my error and apply this also, and then uh, thus I can actually eliminate the error. And another one is zero noise extrapolation. What you do here is actually, you have an error in your gates, but now you actually increase your error intentionally by, for example, for example using a larger microwave pulse, longer microwave pulse. And so you do this a couple of times, and then you can extrapolate back to zero noise. And this works very well. We have demonstrated this already in 2019, but now it took a while of how we learned to make this for a 127 qubit chip. And what we did recently was that we used a problem of a time evolution of a 2D transverse field icing spin lattice to calculate the global magnetization as an observable in those quantum circuits. And uh, so you see here the green dots are the unmitigated um, uh, um, measurements. And at zero and pi half, actually, I don't want to go into too much detail, but at the angle of zero and pi half, we can um, exactly calculate the result. And you see that the unmitigated doesn't fit it, but the mitigated fits it. We then went to an HPC and we had a brute force calculation done with the HPC to also calculate the other angles. And we could demonstrate that the mitigated results overlaps with a brute force exact calculation. And so very fine quantum computing results is also difficult. We know simulation above 100 is classically no longer possible. So when we go to 127 qubit, uh, chip, then um, it's very difficult to verify it. And what we did here is uh, that we were able now to demonstrate that we did it for this light cone. It's actually you can calculate uh, the, the, the observable for one qubit by having different numbers of qubits. And um, we demonstrated that with the error mitigation technique, we actually um, this could be verified still classically for this number of steps and circuit depths and circuit widths. And that the classical approximation methods, however, which were used here, like MPS and ISO-TNS, broke down. There has been in the last three weeks, when after publishing, new techniques which came up, which actually demonstrated that they can reproduce the results. So we are now at a stage where the brute force classical technique no longer works. And the quantum methods which we have developed really go beyond these exact classical methods. And the recent classical approximation results, there were three, they actually differed by 20%. So we are in a very interesting dynamic, interesting regime and time where classical approximation methods can become better by being inspired by quantum and vice versa. So, this is a compute capability with these 127 qubits and a depth of 60, which is, as I said, goes already beyond the classical regime. What is classically exactly verifiable. And um, next year, we want to demonstrate and increase that further by demonstrating the 100 times 100 challenge. So we want to provide a capability, a compute capability, with 100 qubits and a circuit depth of 100, which can be calculated within a day. And so now, the challenge on you is, think about the problem you can map to this compute capability, and hopefully we can demonstrate an advantage for that. So you see, there is not a step function from having a quantum computer now in the NISC area where we still have noisy qubits to a fully error-corrected quantum computer, but we have actually a continuous path where we can use error mitigation in a smart way and different other algorithmic tricks in order to produce a continuous path and uh, come to quantum advantage. And then, of course, later on, utilize also error correction when we have scaled up the number of qubits um, to the requirements. So the question now is, and what we are working on actively is of course improving and optimizing the full stack which I demonstrated and showed you, but also think about what problems can be solved today that depend only on expectation values which we address in the near time, and then also what new techniques can we introduce to increase the complexity of the problems we can access. 
And there's a lot of uh, smart people in the field now. So there's a lot of dynamic progress. And so keep watching it. And um, important is that this all has to be integrated into middleware, into software, that in the end, you as a user, you don't want to worry about the quantum computation below. You just want to have a quantum engine, which you can use in the simulation tools, which we have heard before, and get your result very quickly and better than classically. And so we are, we are building also quantum-centric supercomputer. And I have a little video here which I brought to you to explain what it means. It means you have the user sitting on the computer going via the cloud, going to the quantum data center. You have your, uh, kiss, your, your um, problem, your mathematical problem, which you want to solve. You start the job, you have used actually Python to program uh, and um, the open source software Qiskit to program it. You have the uh, circuits. This will be translated uh, into the uh, orchestration that it's clear what type of classical resources and quantum resources do you need. Then you have uh, this going towards the compiling step because now you have to compile it also into and, and uh, optimize it for the hardware you have available you get this parameterized circuit. Now, what I mentioned before, you use this algorithmic approach to decompose your circuit into different uh, sub-circuits, which you can then run parallel. And um, this then allows you to actually reach um, computation and reach like the continuous path delivered in a way that it's easy for people to consume through a multi-cloud environment and that runs through the data center. Now it's all fed into the quantum computers. You can select different computers. I mentioned we have a range of computers available with different numbers of qubits and uh, different um, uh, coherence times and parameters, which you can see if you log in online. And uh, I don't want to go to the full end, but you now the important step is here, you have to reconstruct the results. And then you have different loops, right? Because you, you do error mitigation, so you have a couple of loops. You can decide also on, which, uh, on the number of loops you want to take. And then you get the results back to the user. So with this, I actually want to stop. And thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you learned a bit more about the new kid on the blog. Thank you.